Hello and welcome to the History Network.org podcast, season 17, episode 5, Sébastien Le Prestre de Vauban. In looking back through history, it is kings, queens, politicians and generals who steal the limelight. Those people who actually do the bidding are often much less well known. How many people are familiar with Sébastien Le Prestre de Vauban, Marshal of France? The foremost military engineer of his day, he was renowned not only for building fortifications, but for developing the art of siegecraft. Born to a poor family of the Burgundian gentry in 1633, he was orphaned at ten. The family lands were seized to pay debts, and he was put under the care of the church. The Carmelite prior of Semur oversaw his education in mathematics, science and geometry, all of which would service him well in the coming years. Under Louis the Fourteenth, France was a turbulent place. In the 77 years of his life, the country only saw peace for 17. That's less than one year in four. So it's with little surprise that Vauban joined the army, though not initially on the king's side. The wars of Fronde saw the king's armies pitched against internal rebels, objecting to his absolute authority. A 17-year-old Vauban joined the forces of Louis de Bourbon, Prince of Condé, as a cadet. He quickly distinguished himself in several siege actions. When offered a commission, he declined, though, on account of his poor financial situation. His first job was to work on the fortification of Clermont. He was next called to the siege of saint Manold, where he was taken prisoner by a royalist raiding party. He was treated well. The kindness shown induced him to change sides in support of the king. Offered a lieutenancy in the Bourgogne regiment by the king's chief minister, Cardinal Mazarin, he accepted. For the next couple of years, once more employed as an engineer, he participated in a number of sieges before joining the newly formed engineers' corps as a King's Ordinary Engineer in 1655. Sieges were directed by a chief engineer, and Vauban started his apprenticeship under Louis-Nicolas de Clairville, one of the foremost engineers of the day. In the next few years he saw much action, wounded on a number of occasions, and in just five years after joining the King's service, was chief engineer at the sieges of Gravelines, Ypres and Audenard in one year alone. Prior to Vauban, siegecraft was a haphazard and often costly affair. Vauban points out in his manual on siegecraft, The generals in command use their authority to decide the direction that the trenches are to take, according to their own pleasure, disrupting the overall plan and the engineer's measures, with the result that he cannot follow any orderly programme and is forced to be the mere instrument of their different whims. I say different, for on one day the commander will follow one plan and the next day his successor will order something different, and as they are not always blessed with any great understanding of these matters, God alone knows the mistakes and the useless expenses they cause and the quantity of blood they spill. Before Vauban, attacking armies would dig trenches that snaked towards the defenders' walls. Digging a zigzag pattern minimised the amount of fire that could be called down upon the sappers. These trenches could only harbour a limited number of guards, though, so were prone to sorties from the defenders. This also led the attackers to concentrate their attacks from the prepared trenches, the area of attack was therefore predictable, leading to heavy losses. Vauban's solution was to dig a series of concentric rings round the fortification, each linked with zigzag communication trenches. More men could be stationed safely in these trenches. Artillery batteries could be brought forward, covering wide arcs, 
multiplying the potential points of attack. The first trench at around 600 metres from the defenders' walls would be at about the limit of their gunfire. The second line would be at 350 metres. Here the batteries would be stationed in prepared positions, usually on raised platforms protected by earth banks, gabions and ditches. The final line would be at the base of the glacis, the earthwork at the base of the defenders' walls. From here mortars would be deployed to neutralise the defenders' fire. A breach would then be sought through either mining or bombardment. Mining was hazardous and in an attempt to improve the technique he advocated a company of miners be raised and he even went so far as to write a treatise on the practice. At the siege of Maastricht, Vauban's parallel lines allowed miners to get close enough to the walls to plant mines to force a breach in the wall. Louis XIV was present. We advanced toward the fortress in broad and spacious trench lines, almost as if we were drawn up for a field battle. At Menin, the garrison commander Pierre-Paul Riquet Comte de Caramont commanded Vauban's parallel trenches whilst he was in defence. Our garrison was strong and had good morale, but the enemies had parallel 140 toises, 900 feet, from the palisade, which was guarded by more troops than we had in our entire garrison, and this parallel was supported by 110 cannon and more than 200 mortars of all sizes, so that sorties were impossible, since their batteries were spaced along the length of the parallel. We therefore had nothing else to do but keep up continual fire to slow down their trenches. For Vauban it was not the quantity of artillery that was important, it was how it was used. In later life he noted, There is nothing more important in a siege than good use of artillery. It is the good use of cannon and bombs that places are captured and sieges shortened. He championed the idea of ricochet fire. Cannon could pound away directly at walls and buildings, but they often did little damage to the defenders themselves. If fired with only half the prescribed amount of gunpowder, underpowder shots didn't have the energy to embed themselves into what they hit, but rather had a tendency to ricochet. Bouncing about could do more collateral damage to the inside of an emplacement defending troops could be hit or gun carriages shattered. Vauban would take great pride in predicting how long any siege he conducted would take. For him it was a simple matter of surveying how long it would take to prepare the trench works. He made sieges predictable and short. He was well aware once the outside wall of any fortification was breached, those inside would more often as not sue for terms before the attacker could storm and sack the castle. Sieges were prestigious, lasting only a couple of weeks and ending, more often than not, in a royalist victory. Of Vauban's 53 sieges, the king personally attended 20, and it proved profitable, with the capture of a single fortress paying up to ten times the amount he could earn in a year on a civil engineering project. When not employed with sieges, he prodigiously busied himself with building fortifications and upgrading hundreds of others. In the age of gunpowder, the castle had developed from the simpler keep with a curtain wall into the star fort. The star shape, made up of many triangular bastions, improved the defence of the fortress. Covering fire could be provided from multiple angles. The shape minimised dead zones close to the walls when the attacker was too close for artillery to fire upon. Walls were also made lower, providing a better platform for gun batteries, and lower walls could be made thicker, usually with brick retaining earth. The brick does not shatter like stone with the impact of a cannonball, and with soil behind it absorbs the impact. Better accommodation was made for artillery, Often it would have a number of firing positions. On the ramparts firing outwards, it could fire upon the enemy's trenches and batteries. 
or positioned to fire into the fortress ditches if the attackers got that far. Depending on how the siege went, the guns could be moved from one wall to another. Lower, thicker walls helped to create ramps and walkways to make the fortress more accessible for guns. Vauban took these design ideas to their extremes. There was nothing new in many of the features he used, but it was the way he brought them all together, and the quality of the workmanship. The sure quantity of fortifications he worked on resulted in his individual style and vision being imprinted on the whole French national defence system. He was an advocate of depth in defence, with tiers of defences that an attacker needed to overcome in order to bring cannon to bear on the inner layers of defences. He was often to use detached fortifications outside the main fort. Ravelin would be built in front of the main curtain wall. These detached triangular fortifications would be used to divide any attacking force before they got to the main wall, while serving as a gun platform to fire upon the enemy. If the Ravelin was captured, the rear wall facing the main fort was small or non-existent enough to deprive the attackers of cover. Counterguards were widely used. Again, these stood detached in front of the main defences and could be used as firing platforms. They also helped screen other defences and break up assault forces. Vauban's fortifications, built on a vast scale, were elaborate and could be confusing to decipher, which helped to bemuse the attacker. He was also pragmatic. He appreciated that no fortress was impregnable in the face of a competent attack. When under siege, either a relief army would have to be sent, or it was the job of the defenders to grind down the enemy inflicting such casualties and strain on their logistics that their ability to mount further sieges that year would be reduced. This would reduce an attacker's progress to a snail's pace, allowing plenty of time for diplomatic negotiations or the defender to organise their defences. With royal support, Vauban sketched out his plan for the famous Pré Carré, a defensible frontier zone based on two lines of fortresses running across France's northern border. The outer line was eventually to run from Dunkirk on the coast through Ypres, Lille, Tournai and Valenciennes to Dinan on the Meuse, while the inner belt stretched from Gravelines through Arras and Cambrai to Charleville. He was promoted to Commissaire Général des Fortifications in 1678. In failing health in 1703, Vauban was finally made a Marshal of France, though he had to write to the King to request the promotion. Unusually for a Marshal, he had never commanded an army in the field, though he had helped many of those junior to him achieve victory through his engineering abilities. Vauban conducted 53 sieges, took part in more than 300 combats, and was wounded eight times. His skill and experience were employed on the construction or rebuilding of more than 160 fortresses of all kinds. Though now remembered for the defences he built, many of which still stand, out of all his technical innovations, those in siegecraft probably made the greatest impact on how wars were fought. If you're not familiar with the Star fortifications, it is well worth doing a quick Google image search which reveals some amazing aerial pictures of fortified towns. Would you like to write a script on a topic we haven't covered yet? Why not send us a line? Some of our most popular episodes have been written by listeners. You can of course drop us a line about anything, info at thehistorynetwork.com. Dot org. So do get in touch if you've got ideas for podcasts, would like to write a script for us, or want to bring us up on an error or point of contention. Whatever it is, we love to hear from you. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to The History Network, written by Angus Wallace, read by Nick Barker. <laughs>